This is a war in which women hold responsible military positions on an equal footing with men, submitting to the same discipline, earning the same pay. In some theaters of war, sharing the dangers of frontline fighting. But it is not only in the field of military operations that women are pulling their weight. They are working on the assembly lines, in munitions factories, helping to produce the enormous bulk of materials that we and our allies must have to fight the war. In the sprawling aircraft factories on the west coast, teams of women flush the rivets that hold together the aluminum skin on the wing of a B-24. This is like punching holes in a tin of scouring powder. Instead of cutting out dresses, this woman stamps out the patterns of airplane parts. Hot plexiglass is lifted out of the processing vat and molded into shatterproof windows for fighter planes and bombers. Curved sections form the bombardier's cage in the nose of a flying fortress. Instead of baking cakes, this woman is cooking gears to reduce the tension in the gears after use. Women can tear down an 1,100 horsepower motor, put it together again, and make it purr. A woman gives directions to the future pilot who is cooped up inside the link trainer, learning the principles of blind flying. The ubiquitous jeep is on every battlefield of the world, from Guadalcanal to Dutch Harbor. Women have clamped instrument dials to the dashboards of thousands of them. One woman guides a machine that turns out thousands of cartridge cases a day. In peacetime, these would be lipstick cases. Women who used to make their own clothes are now stitching silk and nylon parachutes. Every seam is the most important one and must pass a rigid examination before it is accepted. If a parachute is not satisfactory, there isn't a chance for the soldier to exchange it for a new one. The vast scope of the war has created a tremendous demand for all medical supplies. A woman's dexterous hands mold the chamber of a hypodermic needle. In hundreds of United States shipyards, husky women do the same jobs as men. Tough, rugged work that they toss off like veterans. Here are some of the reasons why they're doing these jobs. I have two sons in the Army. Now, I'm in the Army, too, in a way. I wanted to bring my dad home sooner. He's in Greenland. Because my husband's in the Navy, and I want to do a job that means more than working in a department store. We do want women in department stores and other civilian jobs. But we need them in war plants, too. Women who have had no industrial experience are trained by the United States Employment Services or sent by them to factories that teach future workers. Individual consultation determines for what kind of work the applicant is best suited. Would you like to work in a factory? I don't know anything about machines. Can you drive a car? Ride a bicycle? Can you replace a burnt out fuse? Oh, yes, I can do that. Then you can be trained for a job, and the training won't cost you a cent. With the strides that have been made in industrial methods, there is practically no limit to the types of work that women can do. In classrooms, they learn to be inspectors by studying with enlarged models of precision instruments. With a micrometer and the vernier gauge, they can measure accuracy to the one ten thousandth of an inch. Experience has proved that women are especially well adapted to the drawing of blueprints. In one experimental aircraft factory, the entire drafting room is staffed by women. They are taking to welding as though the welding rod were a needle and the metal a length of cloth to be sewn. After a short apprenticeship, a woman can operate this drill press as easily as a juice extractor in her own kitchen. And a lathe will hold no more terrors for her 
than an electric washing machine. But it is not only heavy industry that needs women. They are wanted in hundreds of essential civilian services that must be kept functioning. They have taken over routine jobs at non-military airports. Railroads are carrying an unprecedented load of troops, war materials, and civilian traffic. Women help to keep the irreplaceable rolling stock in good running order. They are collecting fares and driving buses. The messenger boys of today are girls. Office buildings are using girls to run the elevators. Many communities already have women on milk delivery routes. They handle man-sized tractors on the vast farms of the Middle West. and more than man-sized mule teams. Now, some men are worried. My wife works, people think I can't support her. Oh, I don't mind my wife working, but who's gonna run my home? It's okay now, but what about after the war? The women will have all the jobs. Some men asked these questions during the last war. This is what happened then. Women wanted to take an active part in the war as they do today. Nurses saw duty overseas at base hospitals. With the drawing off of so many men to the front came an inevitable labor shortage. The old prejudice against women in heavy industry was broken by the demand for more manpower. And women found work not only in nursing, but in factories, railroad yards, and on the farms. Yeomanettes were the vanguard of our wage. This old newsreel shows them being reviewed by the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, and the Assistant Secretary, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Those were the true glamour girls of the last war, remembered with affection and appreciation for the work they performed when the world then as now was in peril. Women are needed again. Before the end of the year, 2,400,000 more must be enrolled in war work, which means not only in the Army, the Navy, the Marines, but in the factories, on the farms, in various essential civilian occupations now filled by men who are being called to the colors. Every woman who can possibly help is wanted. Their country is calling them.